Janice, and thanks everybody for coming to check out this presentation. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about using predictive analytics to uh, see what's going on with our fermentations and optimize what's going on with our fermentations at the brewery. So a little bit about the shoots to start. Um, we are located in Bend, Oregon, which is kind of the opposite corner of the country from here, right in the center of Oregon. Um, and we were founded in 1988. That uh, picture on the lower left there is our pub in downtown Bend that still has a little 10 barrel brew house that operates um, every day. And uh, we still like feeding people there and have a lot of fun. Um, but in about 1993, we built our production plant. And the picture with the hot air balloon there is a picture of our production plant from the air. Um, it's in a very nice location. When we built it, it was on the outskirts of town. Uh, now it's kind of right in the center, but, uh, but it's a nice place to be, so we're okay. Um, and when we built that, that production facility, we had a 50 barrel brew house, uh, which is in kind of the, uh, the lower right corner there. And, um, and that is still in operation again today. It's a semi-manual brew house, used to be fully manual. Um, now there's parts of it that are automated but still a lot of running up and down stairs and uh, turning valves and stuff when you're brewing over there on that brew house. Um, and the, just above that um, is our second larger brew house that we built in, in 2003. Um, so about five years later, and that one's three times the size. It is a 150 barrel brew house. So barrels are what we measure beer in and a US beer barrel is 31 US gallons. Not exactly the metric system, but uh, what we use. Um, so, so that is 150 barrels every time we do a batch on it. Um, in addition to that, if you look next to the, to the large brew house picture, um, there's a picture of some of our cellar vessels. We have about 50 fermenters out in the cellar, and that's where we're going to get into the predictive analytics of fermentations, that biological process, and so we can kind of help get some efficiency by predicting that process. Um, the, the fermenters vary in size from 100 barrels uh, to 1,000 barrels. And so our largest, largest fermenters are um, 1,000 barrels, and it takes seven brews from our large brew house to fill those. So it takes about a day to fill. Uh, and with all that equipment, we make about 350,000 barrels of beer a year, which, as Janice mentioned, uh, puts us in the top, top 10 craft breweries in the US by volume. Um, and Exciting news, at least, uh, you know, for us at the shoots, hopefully for people over here on the East Coast as well. We are planning to open a production facility in Roanoke, Virginia in around 2020, 2021. Um, and that will enable us to supply beer to everybody in the US. Right now we're in about 30 states. And if you want our beer on the East Coast, you kind of have to go to Virginia, Pennsylvania, and I think North Carolina now. But uh, but those are the only states right now that, that uh, we sell our beer in. That'll change once we open up Roanoke, Virginia. All right, so some more pictures of the plant. This is kind of where I get to talk about what I do. Um, I've been at the brewery for 11 years, and uh, I started as an intern in the brewing department and became a brewer and then a brewing manager. Um, and kind of as, as coming up through there, uh, you know, had an affinity for the technology side of things. So that's how I got into operations technology and, and now the operations technology manager for the brewery. Um, and so some of the stuff we've been working on lately, um, right here you can see our pilot plant. Um, this helps us kind of innovate, stay relevant, very important in, uh, in the craft brewing world. It's a two barrel system. And so really small, we can do a lot of batches on it. And the most important part is if it doesn't taste good, we can dump it. So we can try crazy stuff, and it's a, it's a volume that we're okay with just dumping down the drain if it's not good. Um, this is a fully automated uh, little plant here, which, is, which was pretty fun to work on. Um, and the reason for that is so that we can get data out of it, so that we can scale up brands if we need to, we can run experiments on it, and we do sometimes do uh, experiments on this to optimize our current brands. Um, a lot of it is definitely uh, innovation, trying out new stuff. Um, and so at the end there, that's our little two barrel fermenter. So those are actually the smallest 
smallest fermenters we have, not the 100 barrels, but they're not production fermenters. Up here at the, at the top, you, these fermenters are our 1,000 barrel fermenters. The cones are hanging through the ceiling there. Most of the fermenter is outside um, on top of the roof. But um, so that's kind of the scale. It gets a, from small to large. Um, next to it there, we have our bottle filler. Uh, our bottle filler, is, this is our rinser and this is our filler. It, it packages about nine bottles a second. Um, and we upgraded this a few years ago to get to that, to get to that rate. Um, and it was a fun project. Got to uh, kind of, we have several different systems in the plant. We have Delta V as our DCS up through the end of fermentation. And then once you get to the filler and packaging area, a lot faster machines. So they, HR, they just have their own PLCs running on Allen Bradley. And we're actually using uh, inductive automation ignition to kind of be the bridge between there and communicate between, um, between Delta V and those PLCs. Um, so um, that was fun. And uh, in that tradition, we installed a bunch of packaging equipment <laughs> lately. Um, this one right here is our can filler. That was literally commissioned like two weeks ago. And uh, that, that package is about four cans a second. We're just getting into cans. If you're in one of our distribution areas, they'll be in store soon. We're, we're pretty excited about it. Um, but uh, definitely a smaller line than our bottle filler. But again, similar kind of integration, a lot of fun to commission. Um, up here, this is our first robot in the plant. Um, because we had to jam the can line into such a small, a small area, um, we are palletizing the flats of, of cans with, with this robot to minimize, to minimize the area. It's a lot, lot smaller than a belt palletizer, um, which is what we use for our bottles. And so we could, we could fit it in. It's been working well, and it's fun to watch when, it's, when it is working. Um, and then below it is our racking line. So we recently put, put that in as well. That's doing kegs. It's got two, two li lanes next to each other. And if both of those are running, it can, it can package about four kegs a minute. So that's, that's most of what I've been working on lately uh, with the technology stuff. All right, so getting back to what we're talking about here, Ferment, fermentation phases. This is where we're trying to do prediction. You don't predict everything here, but generally, um, when we go through a fermentation at the Shoes Brewery, we start with filling the tank. That's a fairly obvious step. Then it goes to primary fermentation. That's where the sugars are being converted into alcohol and CO2. We're going from wort, which is what we call unfermented beer and what we fill the tank with, to beer. Um, and then at the end of fermentation, we do a step called free rise, which just helps the yeast end early. Uh, and end healthily. And really uh, what that's doing is kind of raising the temperature set points on the tank and letting temperature kind of naturally increase there as we reach kind of the end point of our fermentation. Um, so once that end point is reached, then we move to diacetyl rest. Diacetyl is a butter popcorn flavor in, in beer. Um, it's an off flavor. It's produced during fermentation. And then the yeast cleans it up at the end of fermentation. And so in diacetyl rest, we are measuring the diacetyl level in the tank, waiting for it to get to a, a low enough threshold that people won't be able to taste, taste it in the final product. Um, then we can move to cooling. That's when we turn the glycol on all the way and just crash the tank temperature down. Um, once we are at cold temperature, we let it sit for two days. That helps all the sediment and stuff fall out of the, fall out of the beer. Um, at that point, it's ready to transfer and filter. Um, and then once we're moving, it's emptying, and then ideally it's empty at the end. So a few of these transitions have manual measurements that we take. So both uh, fermentation and free rise, we're measuring the specific gravity of the tank and converting that to a value called ADF, apparent degree of fermentation. Uh, that you can think of it as a percent fermented of the beer. Um, and then in diacetyl rest, as I mentioned, we're, we're measuring that compound diacetyl. We use a gas chromatograph for that um, and just trying to get to a certain target based on the brand. Um, so yeah, for all, those, for all those transitions, from fermentation to free rise, free rise to diacetyl rest, and diacetyl rest to cooling, we're taking those manual measurements. If we miss a manual measurement, we miss that transition, then guess what, we're losing time, right? And more importantly than that, we might be affecting beer quality. We could be creating flavors we don't want, we could be having the fermentation go too far or not far enough. Um, and so we could, lose, we could lose time in later steps, 
Um, and we could also have beer that's, that's not conforming, so uh, not exactly what we're looking for, right? So this is where we're interested in hitting these transition points exactly. That's why we're using the, pr the prediction. And so as I mentioned, we're measuring the apparent degree of fermentation for that transition from fermentation to free rise and the one from free rise to diacetyl rest. So we started looking at this data. We thought, okay, this seems like something we might be able to predict. And here's a curve of basically that apparent degree of fermentation versus time for our porter. And there's one for our fresh squeezed. And we started thinking, okay, that looks pretty, uh, pretty close, right? Looking good. Uh, oh, and here's our Mirapon Pale Ale and Obsidian Stout. Shameless plug for our brands, right? But <laughs> <laughs> also you can see that there's, the data lines up pretty well. It seems to be a similar shape curve for pretty much all of it. And so we're feeling pretty good right now. You know, here's what we're noticing. You know, you put them next to each other. Okay, yeah, looking pretty good. Starts off kind of slow. You know, we got that curve. <laughs> there we go. Starts off kind of slow there. Then there's kind of this linear section in the middle, right? And then, and then it slows down again at the end. All right, so just a general fermentation curve. Here's how, here's how the, the fermentation's progressing, right? And so this is where we kind of, uh, I'll go back for a second, but this is where we kind of hit the wall, right? We're like, okay, we think we can predict this. We don't have any idea to really, uh, how to go about it, <laughs> you know, like what do we do? And so uh, this is where OSI Soft kind of came in and said, well, we think we can help you guys. They, they, uh, our, all, our, uh, all our data goes through OSI Soft as our historian. And uh, they, have this, they had this new connector, which was the, uh, the integrator for, for Microsoft Azure, right? And they also had what they called this red, red carpet incubation program to help people start using it and they thought we'd be a great case um, and talked to Microsoft, the other side of the Azure package, and, and sure, they, they were ready to work with us. So that was awesome, you know, it was great. They came in, helped us set up the integrator, helped us get the data up to the cloud. Microsoft looked at it, um, you know, and, and we, sent a, we sent a bunch of data up there, but really, you know, these plots that we've been working on, that's what the data scientists at Microsoft started with. They're like, well, let's just look at, look at this ADF compared to past fermentations of the same brand. And sure enough, you know, it, it got a pretty accurate prediction. It's a, this is the, the logistic function. It's a sigmoid curve. And really the ADF is that apparent degree of fermentation at a specific time. Um, a is the maximum value, so that's kind of where the fermentation ends, right? B is the steepness of the curve, and C is also part of that steepness, but it's basically, you know, how much time does it take to get to the midpoint of the, of the fermentation? And then T is time. So, so really, a uh, fairly simple, simple equation, and um, now I'll walk through kind of a, a typical fermentation. And, we're sending that data up with the integrator every 15 minutes or so. And so, you know, whenever we take a reading, that data gets brought into the Pi system, then it gets sent up, um, and then we do some analysis on it um, and generate the curve. So right here is the start of fermentation. Um, and right at the start, we can look at the past fermentations of the brand. We already get a curve, right? So there's our predictive curve. We don't really even have a measurement point yet, but, but this is where we think we're going. All right, then we get a measurement point in there. You know, wow, we're pretty close, 0.21% um, difference between the prediction and the, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was good, that's kind of lucky probably, but you know, great. And redo the curve a little bit. Um, all right, second measurement. Now we're a little further through the, through the fermentation, 1.43. And redo that curve again, another one, 1.14. So we're around 1% 1, 1 error here. It's, that's definitely you know, good enough for what we're looking for. Um, yep, take a couple more. All right, and there, there we've got one more, 1.34. Redo the curve again. And finally, there we go. We, we're nearing the end of fermentation now. And that curve's really pretty dialed. We're less than a percent error. 
And that's kind of typically how it goes. So it's just gonna keep generating that curve every time more data is added to it. Um, starts with that batch prediction, right? And then as you get points for the, for, or sorry, it starts with the brand prediction. And as you get points for the batch, it, it kind of specifies for, for the batch that we're brewing right now. And so if we had certain points that we were looking for, like when's it gonna cross 0.7 on that graph, Oh, we could do that, right? We've got time and we've got, and we've got um, the curve. So that's what we're doing. Um, so here is an example of how we visualize it. So this is a Pi Vision screen. Um, and really, this is showing future data. Um, there we go. So the red line is, is the current time. And then everything, everything over to the left of it is in the past, right? Everything else is future data, um, so you can see those predictions are going out into the future. Those are our actual ADF measurements, the step, blue step graph there. So that's the actual measurements that brewers are taking every eight hours or so, and then putting in the system, and, and they're getting brought. They put it into a database, we bring it into Pi through an interface, um, and then we send it up to Azure. And, um, that is our ADF transition target for free rise in red, and the blue line is our ADF transition target for diacetyl rest. So those are those two targets that we're going for. And so you can see, all right, we've got the prediction, we've got the batch brand prediction in, in purple and the batch prediction in orange, so we can see when each of those targets is being crossed. And up in the top corner, uh, this is just, a, just to explain kind of, that's the cursor, the, the cursor that we use in PyVision, and it's displaying the, the various, uh, the various uh, numbers for, for the time, any time you select. So there's a batch prediction again, and if we look at the time when that crosses the line, we can say, okay, hours to free rise, in 15 hours, we think we're gonna get to free rise, and then in 26, we think we're gonna get to bung. So those are those two transitions we're trying to predict, and we can display it right there. We've measured a few points, um, and, and yeah, we, we're looking pretty good for ADF. It's, uh, and that, that kind of helps us say, all right, if you're gonna check that gravity, maybe don't check it in eight hours, but check it in 15 for sure, and then, and then hopefully we'll nail that point and be able to move it to the next stage right on time. So yeah, this took a while to kind of test it in production, adjust the model, you know, it's good to have that kind of iterative process. And, uh, and Don was talking about it too. It helps to, to get operators that, you know, confidence in the model. Involve them, have them look at it, and, and it's a good thing. Um, yeah, build that trust. And that's the key, right? Um, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, people don't want to lose their jobs, and you start talking about this, they think, Really, we're not trying to take anybody's job away. This is another tool to help us brew better beer more efficiently. We still need those subject matter experts to make decisions. That's something I've definitely heard at other presentations this week. Very true, right? But we need to give the, get them better data so they can make better decisions um, and do things at the right time for better beer. And so that's what this is, that's what this is doing. No brewers lost their jobs as the result of this. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so what is the architecture? I've, I've talked about it a little bit, but yeah, we get the data into our OSI soft Pi system, right, our historian. And then the Pi integrator kind of cleans it. Uh, Don definitely talked a lot about this, so I won't go too much into it, but it organizes it, normalizes it, uh, cleans it up, and really adds context as well. This is a, this is a big uh, part. It uses our uh, asset framework database, it's another Pi database, to add, hey, what tank was this? What brand was this? That kind of stuff. Um, and so adding that context allows us to get it into the SQL data warehouse and have good information to kind of filter on and run those models. Um, and so yeah, there it goes up into the cloud from the integrator. Every 15 minutes, just compiles the data and sends it up. And, uh, and then in, in Azure, do the machine learning, put the predictions back out um, to another SQL data warehouse, and then we bring those back in 
through, a, through another interface, um, basically back into the Pi system. And those were the, were the predictions you saw on the screen. So we can then visualize it in Pi Vision. We could also look at it in Power BI, right? It's in a SQL data warehouse. We could use SS, um, SSRS or you know, any number of reporting tools um, to look at this data. All right, so there's, there's the ADF transitions. The next one we wanted to look at was this diastole rest transition. This is, a, as I said, a measurement we take with a gas chromatograph. And so the lab takes it maybe every 12 hours. There's a little bit more time between readings. And so this is, this is as, if not more important, to, uh, to hit this on time and get to cooling. Um, at this point, you're not going to affect the time that, that future steps take but you might affect the quality of the beer. There's off flavors that can happen if you leave the yeast warm too long, that kind of thing. So, so it's still important to hit it on time. Not to mention that you can just lose you know, 12 hours if you, don't, if you don't move it at the right time. Wow, all right. So there, we, we plotted some of our diastole versus time data, and again, we're seeing, all right, we got a lot of different brands up here. I'm not gonna list them all, but you know, uh, check them out at your local store. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, they all have a similar curve, right? They're all looking, they're all looking fairly, fairly similar. We think we can model it. Hey, and we did some research. It turns out somebody has modeled this. There's a brewing paper out there that says, hey, here's a, a diastole curve for a typical brand. So we're like, all right, let's, let's try that for modeling it. That seems, that seems good. Um, and so yeah, diastole at time t, a is the curve's maximum value, which in this case is, is where was it at kind of the beginning of diastole rest. Diastole really should only reduce during diastole rest. So it's kind of where was it at the beginning. Um, B and C are kind of that, that steepness of the curve, and I'll show on the next slide what happens with them when they're increased and decreased. And then D is, is the ending value. Um, and so we started taking uh, diastole measurements kind of just before we move the beer, because during cooling, you still get some diastole reduction. The yeast is still kind of consuming that. Um, and so we wanted to get a final good value for D. T is time, as always. Um, so yeah, there's the, there's the curve. And, and if, you look at the, if you look at these curves, they're all the same base, but, uh, but here is B and C are like double what they are with the standard curve, and here they're kind of halved. So you can see as those increase, you kind of get the steeper curve and a sharper slope up here, and as they decrease, you get closer and closer to linear. <clears throat> and, and so really, that's kind of where we are right now with, this, with these predictions. Um, we haven't fully operationalized diastole yet. We do have a next step that we want to do. Um, we, we started not normalizing it for the time of the start of diastole rest, but um, we've now done the math and said, okay, we, we really do need to normalize it for time. Batch time is important. We suspect it as much, but the data scientists were hoping that it wouldn't come in. Um, we, we definitely think, think we're gonna take it into account, and so we're redoing the model a little bit to adjust for the start of diastole rest time. Um, but, That'll be here soon. And even what's working right now is, is, is pretty good. It's pretty good to look at. So what are our future opportunities um, with this? Well, there's one more step where we can kind of do some prediction in fermentation, and that's the cooling step. Um, a little bit different style. It'll be a different model. We have a lot of, this isn't a manual measurement, right? It's just you can look at our temperatures as the tank crashes. And so this is already in the system. We got a lot of data. Um, and we could send that up and say, okay, how long until this thing hits maturation uh, temperature? Which is useful from a production planning perspective because it can, say, it can say like, oh, the production planning can know, all right, it's most likely gonna be within a couple hours of this time. So then we gotta wait 48 hours after that and then we can move the beer. So production planning can get a really good idea of when that beer is gonna be ready. Um, and cooling is something that takes, you know, couple days, typically, so it's not a short process. And then, uh, and then the other thing we can do is detect anomalies, right? Something going on with, with glycol or something's going on with a valve on a tank. We could get a, 
early indicator that, oh, hey, this isn't cooling correctly. Hopefully correct it before it's like time to move the tank. And we're like, oh, that's nowhere near the, coo the <laughs> cooling temperature. So. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. And then, then just other opportunities not around fermentation. We'd love to do some preventative, preventative maintenance uh, predictions. That's, that's something that we, we are looking for a, for a subject matter expert right now for maintenance to kind of help us get it started. We don't know exactly what to look for, what, how they're saying, okay, that pump's ready or that valve's ready to be replaced. So, so we definitely are, are trying to start that process now. Then lottering logic, that's a, a brew house step where you're separating liquid from solid. And so you're trying to balance a lot of things there. You want to get good sugar extract. You want to be as fast as possible so that you can fit as many brews to the brew house as possible. You don't want to extract too much stuff that's not sugar and make the work too turbid. Um, and you also have the bed pressure. It's kind of filtering through a grain bed um, as the filter. And so you don't want to suck that down or you'll have to stir it up and then you get a mess on your hands. So anyway, a lot of stuff to balance there. We think that could be a good case for kind of some multivariate predictive analysis. Um, and then, uh, and then GCMS, we just got a mass spectrometer and we're thinking it's generated a lot of data. We're, we're just starting to use it and just kind of see what, what we can get out of it. So we don't know where yet, but we have a feeling we'll be able to predict something with this, with this machine. <laughs> we're excited. Um, what are the benefits? I've talked about them a little bit. Uh, increased quality for sure, you know, fewer off flavors. Um, and just hitting specs, like your alcohol, like very important spec for us to hit. We can't sell beer if we're beyond a certain, certain point from our alcohol that's on the label, right? We, we'll get fined. And so, so, yeah, you know, like that kind of stuff, when you have a more consistent fermentation, just gets more and more dialed. It's a good thing. Um, decreased process time. Uh, you know, you can save 12 hours probably on just, hey, you know, you should have taken that reading that, mu that much ago and now you didn't. But then the key is that if you have a good like fermentation and free rise step, your diacetyl rest is going to be shorter. And that's where diacetyl rest could typically, is typically a couple of days. But if you don't have a good diacetyl rest, you might be sitting there for five days. So, you know, it's something where, where it's a good thing to keep, you can definitely cut down on some time for fermentation and fewer manual measurements. Um, that's always good. You know, you want your brewers making decisions, not taking measurements if possible, right? Um, the other thing I don't have on here, we kind of looked into putting, uh, there is, a, there is a, a device you can put on a tank to continuously measure um, your, your ADF and your percent fermented, the specific gravity of your beer as it ferments. And so we looked at those. For all of our tanks, it was going to be about 750 grand to put one of those on each tank. So that's a lot of money for us anyway. We weren't, we weren't looking to spend that much. And so we definitely saved, saved that cost. The best part is we've looked into it a little more. We were looking into getting it on maybe one of the pilot tanks or something, you know, just so we could get that data of what does it continuously do during a fermentation, you know? And, uh, you know, we've researched a little more, and it works for you know fizzy yellow beer. But if your uh, if your uh, solids content's too high, if you're dry hopping in the fermenter, those kind of things, it just won't even work. So, in the end, had we gone that direction, we would have spent seven seven hundred and fifty grand and not uh, gotten anything out of it. So, uh, definitely, lessons learned. Um, start small and build, and Don mentioned that as well. Definitely a good thing. Start small, start simple. You can always add to it. If you go really complicated at the start, there's a good chance it won't work and you won't know why. And, you know, so it could get frustrating. Um, and again, don't overcomplicate things. Kind of a simple, simple thing. But we, we sent a lot of data up into the cloud, but the data scientists were like, oh, let's start simple, which ended up being great. You know, I think we could use temperatures or outputs of temperature sensors or pressure. We've got pressure on a lot of our fermentations. We could use all of that to get our prediction more accurate. But uh, in the end, this has the resolution we need. We don't need to know within five minutes when it's going to cool, when it's going to be to the next step, right? We just need to know better than eight hours. If it's plus or minus an hour or two, that'll be fine. Um, and then, yeah, verify your prediction over time. So get it out there. 
let people adjust to it, let people learn to trust it, for sure. We did that, we did that well, but we'd definitely do it again. And then something else we didn't do so well um, is we maybe send it out to people a little too early. I think we were all excited about it. Um, and so we hadn't got everything dialed yet, but stability is at least as important as accuracy, right? You want it, you want it working. And now, of course, that we have it dialed, it's all very stable, but there's a lot of interacting systems there. Um, and I guess we didn't realize how excited the users were going to be about it. The brewers were really liking it. And so, yeah, we started, we, we put it out there early, and then they were kind of like, oh, you know, you'd, you'd get all these emails. Oh, it's broken, it's not working, you know, as soon as it went down for any reason. So. Anyway, um, just a good thing to keep in mind. So yeah, that's all I've got. Um, just uh, thanks, thanks to everybody for listening. And also thanks very much to OSI Soft and Microsoft for helping us out with that, with that incubation program and getting us started on this. And then Neil Analytics, once the incubation program was full, Microsoft kind of handed us off to Neil Analytics, who's a Microsoft partner. And they've helped us dial in and make those adjustments and tune those models. Um, and they're helping us with the diastole stuff right now. So thanks to them. Sean Garvin is our seller manager, the subject matter expert on our fermentations. He knows everything about them. He was a great help on this and also a very enthusiastic first user. Um, and then Kyle Kotash, he is uh, my report at the, at the brewery. Extremely smart guy, much smarter than I am. And he's done a lot of work on this. Um, and then Brian Favor. Brian Favor is our brewmaster. He kind of drove this from the beginning. And there's his email there. There's my email if you have any questions. And thanks very much.